Hello and welcome. My name is Johanna Koljonen and this is Crosstalks. Crosstalks is a co-production between Stockholm University and KTH, the Royal Institute of Technology. And today we are broadcasting live from Stockholm University. Our studio audience is exclusively made up of students from the two universities, but most of you are tuning in from all around the world. Our last broadcast had people from 49 countries watching and interacting with us via Skype and Twitter. We're called Crosstalks TV on both platforms. Do take the opportunity to participate on the air. Call us via Skype in about 40 minutes to ask our professors your questions. This program and your feedback may travel fast and effortlessly on the digital highways of the internet, but moving physical objects around is a trickier prospect entirely, and that is the topic of our first talk of the evening. The ability to move people and things from one place to another is the very foundation of modernity, but today our means of transport and travel are challenged by demographic changes, urbanization, rising oil prices and environmental necessity. How do we face these challenges to meet our transportation's needs in years to come? What kinds of technologies will emerge in this field and how will they affect the way our societies and businesses function? With us to discuss these questions are Mandar Dabhilkar, Associate Professor of Operations Management at Stockholm University. Welcome. Maria Burjesson, Docent in Transport Systems Analysis at the Royal Institute of Technology. That's KTH. Welcome. And Mats Lexell, researcher at the Division of Electrical Energy Conversion School of Electrical Engineering at KTH. Welcome. Thank you. Please we give them a warm welcome. <coughs> Let's start with Maria. Why is it essential for a society to have a good and efficient means of transportation? Well, the first thing, it's not really transportation that is essential. What is essential is accessibility, that people can meet each other, that people can access firms, and firms can access uh, employees, potential employees. That's crucial. And of course, transport is an important part of that, but equally important is where we localize f people and firms, so where people live. Uh, and that is equally important. We sometimes tend to forget that. Why it's important? Because our economy is more and more driven into knowledge-based specialized labor market. And that means that we need, we need to enable specialization. So one person with a particular skill needs to find an employer where the skill uh, is useful. And that increases productivity very, very much. So that's important. Another thing is that high accessibility regions tends to breed new ideas. So one person meets another person and then come up with a great idea. And then this is inspires the third person coming up with an even greater idea. And they need to meet to Would do you this. Say high accessibility yeah. region, does that mean city, basically? Or could it be yeah. something else? Yeah, M mostly it means cities. But uh, it doesn't have to be. It could be small cities. But the essential thing is that people can meet and specialize. And then the people need, yeah, need to meet. And what is the, how is the transportation landscape changing, if we're just looking uh, immediately at the immediate challenges? You get to set up the conversation here. Yeah, how it's no changing. Pressure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have, for, because specialization, new ideas, innovation become, is becoming more important than the importance of cities. Are, we have a fast urbanization. And that's for good, of course, but it has, I mean, there is bad things as well. You get co congestion perhaps long commuting distances, and we know that um, can just long, stressful commuting times is, is not good for people, it's not good for the environment. So that's one of the key things, how do we com combat that? And then, yeah, secondly, we have the yeah, increased emissions of greenhouse gases from, from traffic. That's also an important part. And then public spending on new infrastructure. It's, it's a significant part of public spending, and this is a key problem in the future. Also, since it seems like productivity mm -hmm. in the sector of building new infrastructure is not uh, uh, increasing as in other sectors, so it's becoming relatively more expensive all the time. And that's another yeah. key challenge. So uh, what I hear you say is that people need to be together uh, in, mm. for, for instance, cities for societies to work, but that creates 
for instance, congestion, uh, which is the negative. So, that, so it's about finding a sweet spot there somehow, mm -hmm. while not ruining the environment. The good thing we have a lot of great minds gathered today, because this is not a small challenge for us to solve. Mats, uh, your research focuses on the electrification of transportation. So that would be things like electrical and hybrid vehicles that people are, are often familiar with, but also electrified roads, which yes. sounds more exotic to me. Could you explain a little bit about your uh, work? Electrification of transportation is not a new thing. I mean, the first cars were electrical, we have railways that are electrical, but what we see today is that the normal transportation means that we have, the cars and the uh, trucks, etc., they run on fossil fuel, and that's very inefficient to do it in that way. But by electrification of the vehicles, first of all, we can make the energy conversion much more efficient. But we still have to have the energy on board the vehicles. And uh, today you can fuel your fossil car with uh, pe uh, petrol or diesel, and uh, to give you a hint of it, you, in your hand, when you are fueling up your car, you have roughly one of the largest wind power generators. That's the power that you have in your, in your hand. And we can never do that with batteries. We cannot do that kind of. So we, we need, at the end, we need to supply our vehicles in a very efficient way with energy more or less continuously. And that's why we see a, a future for making the road-bound vehicles behave like railways. But then we can discuss whether we should have railways or we should have uh, rubber-bound vehicles. But that's uh, another question. Uh, what are the main challenges for making this happen? It sounds like an entire sci science fiction scenario uh, to me. Uh, I in one way it is. It's al already demonstrated. Like in Stockholm in, during the 50s, we had buses running on electricity. Uh, uh, there are companies today that are demonstrating that you can have this kind of continuous supply to the vehicle. So it's, it's not uh, science fiction, definitely not, but it's very costly. Mm -hmm. We are changing one system to a completely new type of system. And how to deal with that, that's a big challenge. That's right, I see. Um, we're going to return to this, I think. Mandar, you specialize in operations management, and I understand this to be how businesses and other large organizations structure their moving resources around. Um, and today, of course, that involves quite often moving things and people across very large uh, geographical distances. So what kind of challenges are you seeing in, this, in the field of transportation? I see mainly four um, global macro trends. Uh, that impacts uh, logistics and supply chain management. Uh, one is um, the population growth and migration, uh, and that leads to increased congestion, for example, in, in cities like Stockholm. But we also attract people from all over the world to Stockholm, uh, and also uh, have people from Sweden uh, moving uh, abroad. Uh, a second macro uh, trend is uh, economic leveling and uh, connectivity, which means that uh, consumer behavior all around the world uh, becomes more similar. Uh, so that also has implications for supply chain management. Uh, and, and then we have uh, geopolitical uh, uh, circumstances and conflicts and turbulence uh, around the world related to scarcity of uh, national resources like oil, for example, but also minerals and metals which are important for producing certain high technology. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, we have uh, climate change uh, that uh, supply chain managers, of course, has to take into consideration. But we also have um, uh, extreme weather conditions. We had the tsunami uh, effect uh, in Japan, for example, that affected many Swedish suppliers. Uh, yeah, and so on. You've done yeah. research on this. Uh, so f <coughs> what, how supply chains can be restored uh, or made more resilient in, in case of disasters. Yes. Uh, so for instance, mm. uh, in, the, in, the, in the event of a tsunami. Mm. Uh, I'm, I mean, I, I think to the layman, it's not mm. even obvious why uh, something happening at the end of the mm. world would affect uh, production mm. somewhere entirely different. But what can... Mm. What strategies can organizations employ to make the, the supply chain stronger? Yes, um, there are, I mean, uh, the current assumption in, in literature and among many practitioners is today to try to develop redundancy in their supply chain and logistic systems and also develop uh, and implement excess inventory. 
Uh, but we have a different take uh, on this based on our study that we have uh, uh, run and just completed actually. And that is to look at behaviors uh, that supply chain managers or production managers can implement uh, in, in, in the event of a supply chain disruption like the tsunami, for example. So it's very much about the behaviors that you undertake uh, in the event uh, of a disruption. And that can be uh, both proactive uh, actions that you, ha that you undertook before the event that you planned. You had scenario planning, for example, uh, or recruited skilled employees that had such experience. But then there are also certain practices that you undertake at the uh, event. Uh, and that is uh, both how you collaborate with suppliers, for example, but also how you collaborate internally, what kind of leadership you develop, how you run projects, and, and so on. I, I'm curious about how, from the, the operations management perspective, what the, the advent of electrical roads makes you think. Do you think immediately that's interesting or that's a terrifying idea because it's another potential weakness in the system? What if you don't have electricity, then suddenly you don't have anything? Yeah, being without electricity, of course, can, can be one aspect, but, but one other, I think when we talk about new technology like, like Mats uh, introduced here, um, I think we have, from a, so from a supply chain management perspective, uh, we have to think in terms of priorities that the supply chain manager has to take in, in his or her everyday working life. And one is, of course, of trying to be as flexible as possible to the market at the lowest possible cost. That is one uh, thing which is prioritized. Another one is, uh, of course, uh, of trying to meet uh, demand uh, and supply and match demand with supply and also to handle uncertainty. And then we have to think about how can technology here help? Um, and if you take other technology, like information technology, uh, we know that that kind of technology can help uh, to make supply chains more visible uh, and so on. But with this kind of technology, it's not perhaps that very evident. So we have to think about how the environment uh, becomes a priority for the supply chain manager. Mm -hmm. And here we have different alternatives. Uh, one is, of course, the pricing mechanisms. Uh, perhaps, uh, I'm, I'm not having all the, the solutions here, mm -hmm. but one is perhaps of um, making it more costly to produce, then one has to take this into consideration. And then, of course, we have regulation, uh, which perhaps is, uh, mm. uh, I mean, we, we have, we, we're living in a world of deregulation today, uh, but uh, perhaps regulation is also one alternative, and that can help uh, to enable, because I definitely think that this kind of technology is, is very important. Yeah. Uh, Maria Berges, how do you react to the idea of mm. electrified roads? Well, I think it's, it's great. Everything that can make more things, transport more efficient is good, whether it's would uh, be, um, but it's important that it's robust. Uh, it, it's, if it once in a while is a problem and, and people can't reach each, each other, that might not be a problem. But if it's con a lot of problems, then this will, th this will hurt society. I guess individual mm. vehicles would have redundant systems with batteries and so on. <coughs> but, but how, in general, what's your feel about about performing a shift, again, I'm trying to do it from the small, mm. so from the taxpayer's perspective here. I, is it really a viable strategy for us to shift into a completely new kind of transport system that requires so much uh, new infrastructure when perhaps we should just travel less or, or, or fix the ones we have? It's, uh, it's, it's of, of course a very uh, relevant question to put here, how to transport and should we invest in a very large new system. However, one thing that I think we have to remember is also that we are electrifying the complete vehicle, uh, sorry, the complete mm. society today. Mm. Everything is today automation, you have electricity to open doors, to do whatever, so you're already becoming extremely um, dependent on electricity supply. So already there we have this uh, a big problem of one resource. But the nice thing with electricity is that we could build up, uh, we want to call it some kind of internet uh, electricity supply all over Europe and you can even span it and have it intercontinental if you want to because then you have a internet of energy. But you should not think of it as a free internet of energy. So it's not cheap the energy. It's cheap will always be expensive and it will be just become more and more mm. precious, more expensive later on. But having an electrical chain for supplying energy for doing the transportation, in fact, makes it more uh, versatile. We can have different sources and we know that the sun 
will always be the first source, mm. but by having an electric uh, uh, grid, we can in that grid mix different sources of the electricity and then dispatch it to many different uh, uh, users. But definitely it's a huge undertaking if we want to make this transition and change it. Mm. But it's crucial that we can use our old uh, infrastructure. It, transportation systems changes very uh, slowly mm -hmm. and so we need to keep to use what we have because it's worth really a lot of money as it is. Still, I find mm. it very hopeful and very interesting that you say that the sun is, is obviously going to be the first source. I think two years ago when we started talking oh. about saving, a world on this <laughs> on, on saving the world on this show, yeah. that was not <coughs> an obvious observation. So that's very exciting. Mm. Now I think we, it's time for our first guest join, to join us on Skype. Uh, there we have, have you, Peter Koons, your division manager for the city of Portland, the Bureau of Transportation's Signal, Street Lighting and ITS division. Uh, that's a long title. Uh, welcome to Crosstalks. Oh, thank you for having me. And also uh, just joining us now is Steph Proust, professor at the University of Leuven in Belgium, former guest professor at KTH. Welcome, professor. Okay, thank you. Let's start with Peter. Peter, I am not entirely certain what your title means. Could you tell us what you do at work? So I manage uh, the traffic signal and street lighting system for the city of Portland. So the electrification of the system, as was just described, is something that's going on in the city of Portland. We're trying to determine how fast we need to do um, things to make electric vehicles work well in the city. We're looking at uh, a wide variety of transportation solutions for all of the uh, challenges that uh, the, uh, the panel just described. It sounds like a fun time to be, to be working with these issues. Well, innovation is something that we, uh, we, we try to embrace in the city where we can. Uh, we look for uh, new ways to get people where they need to go. And, and as a city, as, as we have uh, kind of returned to the urban center, it's been, uh, there's a lot of energy around, uh, uh, around changing, changing uh, the way we've uh, done things in the last 35, 40 years. You're engaged in creating a better environment for cyclists in particular. Uh, can you imagine that society would at some point put cyclists before cars? Well, I think uh, we don't have to necessarily imagine it. I think there's models around the world that uh, of cities that are that are doing that, that are that are way ahead of Portland. Um, it's certainly something that, uh, from a transportation infrastructure standpoint, um, moving people either via walking or by bike uh, is is advantageous to a city. The maintenance of a transportation infrastructure, if you're biking or walking, is a lot less than if you're trying to move people uh, via cars or even buses. That's great. Do, do you think? Do, how do you think it would affect our quality of life uh, if we were to to have a higher percentage of cyclists? Well, certainly, I, I think some of the. Uh, the, if you if you look at happiness as a, as, a, as the quality of life, certainly there are communities that uh, have a very high walking and, and biking percentage that are very happy. Um, the uh, so so that's something that I think if you think about trying to integrate uh, active active living um, exercise into your daily life, certainly by being multimodal, by even taking the bus, that's uh, presenting opportunities for people to walk that uh, maybe we don't have if we're uh, just focused solely on moving people via car. That's great, thank you. Uh, Steph Prost, in your research, you have studied transportation in relationship to environment and, and climate change. So what would you like to add based on what, what we've already talked about? Um, I will have a rather dissenting opinion, maybe on, on some of the issues, and that makes it interesting uh, in academic debate. Um, I used to have the same discussion with my colleagues in engineering also on renewable energy and uh, engineers tend to go for very fancy technologies, solutions. Um, I'm a little bit more down to earth uh, and I think first of all that there is no scarcity of uh, oil resources or gas resources. Uh, I think I don't see that as a big problem. I agree that climate is an issue, and it's an important issue, but uh, you have to deal with climate in a smart way. And I don't think we are doing that in Europe. 
uh, I think it looks uh, sensible that uh, we try to save oil and maybe move into electric vehicles. But if you really think more deeply about it, and if we are the only ones doing that, like in Europe, we this strategy made some kind of backfire in the sense that what we do, let's say the barrel of oil we save in our cars, and we do that, by the way, it's still a very expensive way of uh, reducing carbon emissions. The way we do it, um, it may very well be that the same barrel of oil in the end will be used somewhere else in the world or will be used later. And so um, we have to really think twice before we go for very drastic technologies. It could be much better to go for, uh, let's say, less expensive solution. Such as? Um, such as, uh, okay, biking is, uh, I like biking, <laughs> and I mean, we could go for electric bikes. Mm. And uh, I would say invest in electric bikes rather than in hybrid buses or electric buses, mm. things like that. Um, so yes. it, it's uh, just going for uh, more fuel efficient cars. Yes. Or let's try to sell the fuel efficient cars we have in Europe, try to sell them, get them accepted in the rest of the world. That's right. That is, Okay, very so much more efficient mm. on a global, uh, on a world scale to reduce emissions by selling yes. these technologies than by selling electric cars. That's, Nobody that's is waiting for electric cars. We, 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 I think we're going to have to let in the, the, the rest. This is uh, suddenly became a contentious issue. Who would like to go? Maria Bariason. Yeah. On what? <laughs> Hi, Steph. <laughs> <laughs> Maria agrees with me. Uh, do, do you agree? It, I, I think it sounds, uh, the idea that, that, I mean, this goes against everything we learn mm. from the media today, uh, that, that uh, maybe just keeping driving the cars we have, that they're fuel efficient enough, for instance. Yeah, this is I, a pretty controversial position, I think. I agree that we can do a lot without so much fancy new technology. For instance, we have a trend of increasing the, heavy, the size and the weight of cars. So if we just try to break that trend, and maybe have, have smaller cars, we could, we could do, do a lot, at least something. But then I also think it's very, the cycling is very important. I think it's useful and good, and it improves happiness and health and so on. But essential for that is that we manage to build cities densely enough for, to enable people to cycle and that is a real challenge not to have cities sprawling out when we have increased urbanization and that's that's a difficult issue but i think it's very important and that's fundamentally a, a political problem yeah and mm -hmm. not only because not only because of, of uh, emissions and greenhouse gases but also because people are not happy with long travel distances and stressful commutes and people seem to want to live close to each other uh, one thing that, that worries me a mm. little bit about this is that all of the solution when we're talking about new transportation systems or, or how we should build our cities, mm. a lot of that is, is we're looking at a 10, 50 year perhaps mm. perspective of when the new cities are built and so on, or the new roads can actually be there. And, and we do need urgent action so, so that on, on emissions. So there, I think that, the, again, that, that would support the cycling and the electric bikes and, and so on, mm. uh, regardless of, of whether there is in fact a scarcity in oil and gas, the emission problem remains. Mm. Uh, much well, I, I agree with you, Steph, that I mean, walking is the most efficient way. It requires two kilograms. Biking, 20 kilograms. And as you say... But so the is that the weight of the vehicle? Two the kilograms. weight is 1,000 kilograms. So that's, we, have that to do, shoes. we have to do less <laughs> with more, so to say. But then, of course, it, at what technology level should we, should we do less with more? And uh, then I think I'm a bit more technolo technology... Uh, positive but that per than perhaps Steph that technology can do quite a lot to help us to do it more efficiently um, con concerning whether we should uh, f continue with fossil fuel or not uh, that, that's I think that's a very big discussion to mm -hmm. take here um, but we have to do more with less at least and then technology is definitely a very good way to solve that problem mm -hmm. but for, for sure I don't think we will have uh, cars in our cities in the future and that's not 
in, in the long run, we will we will reduce the number of cars in in cities very soon. But look what's very Hamburg. soon? Is that is this well, ten look years? In, look in Hamburg, for example. Mm. They are making a, a, a very bikeable and walkable city. They expect to more or less get rid of the uh, cars in the city. In a, I don't know the number of years, but in a very short time. Well, let's ask Portland. Peter yes. Kunz, when you project, uh, the, I mean, I'm assuming you're working from a sort of master, master plan. How does Portland look at, at its future here? Will it have less cars, for instance? Uh, well, I, I think less cars is probably unlikely. I think that the percentage uh, of, of I mean, one of our aspirational goals in our climate action plan and in our bike master plan was 25% bicycle mode split mm -hmm. in 2030. So that's you know, on par with uh, several Dutch cities. It's a very strong aspirational goal. Will we get there? I, I think that's a, that's a political question. Do we have the political will to get there? Um, I think we, it recognizes that uh, in Portland, density is being discussed as, a, as maybe it's, it's a, we can't, we're not building a dense levels that allow just people to walk to work. So cycling is, expands that commute, um, shed, shed that opportunity to go a little bit further than you can walk. Um, it offers a great opportunity to uh, provide, again, a low cost transportation, where if you don't have to provide a bus, you can, you can get three miles, four miles uh, to your destination. Uh, via cycling. Mm. So we've, we've looked at that as a potential opportunity and, and think that that's, that offers some promise for a city of our size. Uh, but no, I, I think the, the, we're hoping that when new people come to Portland that they will think about maybe using the bike as opposed to just getting in their car uh, like they, they would um, maybe where they're coming from. That's great. Mandar Dabilkar, how do you, what's your reflections on this? Um. Like uh, Matt said, it's a very big uh, discussion about uh, the uh, emissions part, and mm -hmm. if we shall, uh, maybe we shall take that some other. But if you want to uh, reduce the emissions, and if you look into industrial supply chains, there are uh, things that you can uh, do actually. Uh, and from a supply chain management perspective, it's very much a matter of designing your network of uh, um, facilities, I mean, where you produce or store your goods and the kind of transportation modes that you use. I mean, if you use trucks or air freight or ship and so on, and then the inventory levels of, of this material. So there are uh, in industry today different kinds of configurations that you can undertake and implement uh, in order to reduce your emissions and at the same time be more cost efficient. So that is something that you can do and, and being done. Uh, I've, I've heard that there is a trend. I don't know. Sorry. Peter. If I can jump in, that the, one of the things that we've been trying to do in Portland is to look at traffic signals as a source of emissions. And huh. one of the things that is an opportunity is making the traffic signal smarter. If the traffic signal could determine there's a truck there, perhaps it's an opportunity to prioritize the truck, move the truck through the intersection as opposed to stopping it. We have done that with buses. There's the opportunity to do it with trucks. Well, that's interesting. I, I was about to say that, that I've heard that there is a trend that, that some industries are moving their production closer to their markets yes. again, when, when perhaps previously there has been this, this idea of moving it where the production, where the labor would be cheapest, yes. for instance. Is, is that correct? Yes, uh, but I'm not sure that the reasons for that is um, uh, emissions or uh, it is related to logistics. Many Swedish manufacturers have faced uh, issues when it comes to um, uh, transportation, I mean the time and quality issues and that's mm -hmm. inventory levels. But I think the reasons here is more that there, there is a very strong link between product development and technology development and production and this is one of the reasons why you want to keep it close. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, yeah, I think there are other and or more reasons for, for this. I'm, I'm going to dare to talk a little bit about more about the, the environment and, and emissions because let's face it, these are these are the the deciding questions of our of our generations, I guess. Uh, so one thing that that I, I find interesting is that businesses are basically already on board with the fact that that they that they will legislation will become 
harder uh, and make more demands on them. And already the, the corporate world is assuming more responsibility or forced to assume more responsibility for their, the environmental impact of their operations. And I, of course, I, I mean, again, this is a layman view, but I'm assuming that transportation will be one key factor uh, in, in how the commercial world uh, operates. Uh, isn't that a win-win scenario? It isn't if you if you make your if you make all of your your chains more efficient your transports more efficient and so on doesn't that kind of pay itself, or am I just being very naive here? Who would like to answer? Mats looks like you uh, have an opinion. Okay, uh, can I? Come yes, in, step, yes, please. Okay, sorry. Uh, yes. <laughs> interesting point. Now, um, I think whenever you want to save emissions, it's best to do it at the lowest cost. Mm -hmm. It looks obvious. Now, the implication is that uh, if you just look at the pricing of one uh, ton of oil, if we use it in road transportation, use it in air transportation, or use it uh, for heating purposes or production purposes in industry, just in Sweden or whenever any European country, what you will see is that whenever we use it in transportation, we will pay it twice or three times as much as when we use it for just production purposes, or when we use it for, let's say, in air transportation. So one of the things we should be aware that if we are trying to save one ton of oil in truck transportation, we, what we'll actually, we are saving obviously the equivalent of one ton of oil, but at the same time, what we are doing is saving a lot of taxes. Uh, so whenever we want to balance efforts between the transport sector and other just manufacturing uh, uses of oil, I think we have to be very well aware that in the transport sector, we have already put a very high tax on the use of oil compared to, and then this makes that we have an imbalance in, for the moment, in the efforts we make in the road transportation sector versus uh, air transportation, where actually there is no tax at all, mm. versus uh, manufacturing use of oil, where there's also virtually no tax at all. So I think that's one point in consideration whenever we want to see how hard we have to push for extra efforts. And obviously industry, if you say to industry, using a truck is very expensive because we tax your fuel very high, Industry will react, and industry say this is win-win for us, but we have to be careful. It's win-win for industry, but it's not win-win for society. That's right. That's very interesting. Thank you, uh, Mats Lexan. No, I think the, that was a really good point. Is the win-win situation? Of course, we want to make things more uh, if efficient, so to say, but we also have to think of what um, what the price is to make this efficiency simply. Yeah. Well, I think there are some good examples, congestion pricing, for instance, which can actually improve the commuting, commuting travel for those who need to travel by, by car, but, and you still get money left. So that's one policy that actually could be a, a real win-win situation. Another one is that people, when they buy new cars, they can't take into account the energy consumption or the fuel cost of this car over the, 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 li the life of this car, 20 years or so. They can't because it's too complicated. It, it's too complicated. It seems to they calculate as if you buy a heavier car, the energy or the oil, the cost of the gasoline will, will be higher and over 20 years. But they only take that into account for about two years. Huh. So to help consumers trying to meet, um, yeah, have the right price when they decide what cars to buy, what car to, car to buy, could be one such policy that would be a win-win situation as well. Um, I'm starting to understand mm. from this conversation that we do need, we will keep needing cars, certainly in a, in a country as spread mm. out as, as this one. But one, would, one could reason in a connected world that enables uh, us to meet like this, uh, perhaps we wouldn't need to travel as much as we do. We wouldn't even need to leave our house as much as we do. Uh, and there's been a lot of talk of this being as a sort of societal change that will happen. Is there any proof that that is already happening? Maria, for instance. Uh, no, why would that be? No, 
people have been predicting for 100 years since the telephone uh, was invented, basically, that with more telecommunication, we wouldn't be needing to meet each other as much as we did. At, at the same time over this period, the, the need for physical meetings has just increased, or the, the mm. usefulness of them. So I don't think so. And I think one of the reasons is that our communication become more complex as well. And when we have more complexity, more cross-culture contacts, communications, phys the need for physical meetings things are uh, becoming uh, more important. So I think transportation needs will be there. So telecommunication, telecommunication is, not, is not the answered answer. I'm going mm. to ask you a bit of a wild question. I was a child in the 1980s, and I have to say that I am a little bit disappointed with the new millennium. I, there are no flying cars, there are no hoverboards, and there are no jetpacks. I think the future has failed us. And you haven't spoken very much about drone deliveries and driverless cars and these kinds of things. But if you could indulge in speculation, when will we see a science fiction type breakthrough in transportation? Who would like to begin? Steph, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> no. I think not being an engineer, I'm the wrong person to ask this question, but anyway, I think these things will come whenever the need is high. Mm. And uh, for instance, like Maria, I think that uh, just having road pricing, making sure that only those people that really know, uh, need to be somewhere at a point where there's a lot of congestion, you only have, will have these people and that's actually the effect you will reach with road pricing. Mm. You will not necessarily decrease overall volume, but you will just focus at certain hours who is uh, who should be on the road. Now, um, so I don't immediately see if you have a good pricing system, there is no immediate need for um, having these drones or helicopters, whatever. I think uh, we will see uh, drones and helicopters uh, already operating in warehouses. Yeah. So as you know, so there is uh, Amazon probably already using them. Um, so I think uh, it will first go be manufacturing where yeah. you have a well-organized system, much right. easier to start than, than in, let's say, regular roads. I, I, I hear you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Peter left there a little bit. Peter, wh when is the science fiction breakthrough coming to Portland? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, the uh, bicycle advocacy community uh, jokes that uh, a bicycle with a uh, with a dozen of donuts on the back is the new uh, jetpack. <laughs> all the energy you need. Right. Um, but but in reality, uh, Google Google is making a big push into autonomous vehicles, and uh, we are uh, we're, we're, there's a lot of discussion at the Institute of Transportation Engineers to describe. It, what needs to happen on the infrastructure side so that we're prepared for the coming of uh, potentially um, autonomous vehicles or at the very least what the vehicles can do to improve safety to detect a pedestrian in the in the roadway to detect uh, when they're getting too close to another vehicle so mm -hmm. we're excited about that opportunity to really uh, use those new technologies to make things better on the infrastructure. That's exciting. Mandar, what's your but science fiction view? I think uh, it's, I mean, compared to the 80s, it is here I mean, it comes to information technology and how information technology is helping supply chain manager just to be more visible, for example. So I think um, some of that we, we have already been able to. And I'm just uh, being ungrateful <laughs> that I'm not finding it magical anymore. What about Maria? <laughs> well, I would answer something like Mandar, uh, but there, it's already here. But I think it's important, I don't know, when we have self-driving cars, but I think it's important that we don't try to plan the future too much mm -hmm. as p transport planners, but we just put up the right rules and right prices for things and then let uh, development come and innovation as it, as it, as it goes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Matt's final well, word on the future there? Uh, uh, yeah, I think I uh, agree here a bit, because if you go back to the 80s, it was so obvious that one of the goals in the life was to have a car. And that would be parked 90% of the time or 95% of the time. Today, young people, I don't think there is that kind of dream to own a car. They want mobility. No. They want, what did you say, availability to... Um, accessibility. Accessibility. accessibility mm. as, and that's already here. And that's a dramatic change to the 80s when the car, the object was what, were you, what you were after. Today, you know what you want. The object to do that for you, well, that can be many different things. So, uh, yeah. in, in one way, it's already here, I think. Th that's a very, very thought-provoking. Yes, Peter. 
I think the shared economy is something that is uh, is, is what he just described. It's yes. something that's uh, as as you think about the '80s, uh, it was a lot of greed. There was uh, there was that aspect of I've got to have it. Uh, now it's well, it, I can borrow someone's. I can use my neighbor's uh, car to go get my my kids' bikes at the street at the street. So mm -hmm. we have those sorts of opportunities. I think that are it's such a changing behavior that uh, is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think it's time for a question from the audience. Who has anything? Yes, please. Just go up to the microphone, please, and state, state your name, perhaps, and what university you're from. Yes. Yeah. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Mina. I'm from KTH. Hi. A um, master student. I was wondering, because we've been talking a lot about vehicular uh, transportation, but as like 2% of the harmful emissions in the world are from aviation. So since we're talking about transportation, how does that come into the equation of like increasing accessibility and at the same time decreasing mm. the harmful emissions? Thank you for your question, Mina. Aviation, who would like to, who would like to answer? Mandar? No? no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Steph? If you want, yeah, okay, yes. in, in aviation, <laughs> if we look at aviation, um, aviation world, I think, has become much more efficient than in the past. So just uh, regular planes have also increased uh, fuel efficiency 30-40%. They're also much better filtered in the, in the past. So we tend to have, we used to have, let's say, 10-15 years ago, these national monopolies, um, planes that were half empty, uh, now we have much better pricing, we have competition, so we have lower prices, planes that are better filled. The only problem that is uh, still there is that if you look at uh, fuel use, emissions of CO2, we do not enough uh, in air transportation compared to road transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm. What about Mats? I, I think I would add that also that the uh, aviation is definitely a big problem, as you say, and uh, what we advocate here is to use the primary energy that we have as efficient as possible. So, for example, by having electrical roads, we could use a solar panel to fuel up your car, but we can never have a few solar panel to fuel up a, uh, a, a plane. But perhaps we can have biofuels, and we can use the biofuels for the planes, because we will never have an electrical road for them. So, uh, of course, there will be special solutions for... Uh, different areas, and uh, aviation will perhaps be a very special solution, and thereby very costly also, because it's very precious to be possible to be able to move all over the globe in um, 12 hours or something like that. I think for people in the academic community, certainly, uh, yeah. the, the career path involves uh, moving away from your family and so on, and, and air traffic feels uh, completely necessary mm. for that. Uh, just a brief poll, which ones of you think that air traffic will be significantly more expensive over, let's say, the next 10 or 20 years? Yes. I think that. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Is it? Is the, yes. everybody I, agreeing? Maria, no. I don't. I, 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 and Steph, no. <laughs> no, no. I don't think it will become. Uh, I don't see oil prices rising uh, very strongly. Obviously, Europe is trying to uh, implement a carbon pricing system for planes, so everything which is air transportation within Europe has been blocked by the rest of the world. And I think, honestly, I don't see that changing in the coming 10 to 20 years. Um, so I don't see strong increases in uh, pricing of That's very uh, interesting. the price of planes. No. Maria. Well, usually things tend to change very slowly in transport system, and I also <laughs> trust <laughs> Steph in this matter, but I don't know. Maybe, but probably things are changing slowly, even yeah. in the air industry. Yeah. Interesting, thank mm. you. Do we have another question from the audience? Be brave. Be brave. No, that's right. <laughs> well... Can I come back to... to yes, please, uh, Steph. That was, was discussed, yeah. Um, I think we think a lot about better pricing of uh, roads, uh, whatever. So I'm living in a university town. We have 40,000 students, 400,000, population of 100,000 people. One of the major problems, we have more or less tried to ban cars from the city, but we gave free public transport for the students. 
The result has been exactly the reverse of what we wanted. We have become a bus town rather than a parking town. And so, uh, and I think this is increasingly becoming a problem. Uh, We have been advocating much more the use of public transport, which I understand. But the pricing of public transport has not followed. Uh, We should start to price the use of public transport in the peak as much as we do for the, the use of the cars. And again, it's some kind of counterintuitive, but it makes sense. Once a bus is full, if you need to transport an extra passenger, you need more buses, you need more trains. And this is a very costly operation for public finance. That's very, that's fun. On this program, quite often we let people we let people wish for one change in public policy or one change action that humanity would take. And I think this is interesting. So better pricing, smarter pricing across the different where that takes all the system into account would be Steph's uh, wish. And now Peter is in an interesting position, of course, since you already are uh, in a in a position of power in a in a public structure. But what would be your one wish for one change? Uh, Gosh, that's a that's a loaded question. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the the one the one wish would be uh, more more control over um, what we do as a region as opposed to just our city. We have uh, political boundaries that uh, that create challenges for us in terms of how we move forward. We may have a policy in Portland, but it doesn't necessarily uh, play well with our neighbors. So it's trying to figure out those those political elements that are really some of the challenges for us. I think. Oh, that's huge, yes. I live in Copenhagen, so the whole Oresund region has this combination of tens of municipalities in two different countries trying to solve these things together. It's a big challenge. What about you guys? Do you have a one wish? Briefly, anyone? Manda? Yes, um, I hope that um, supply chain uh, managers and planners are more wisely uh, designing their networks uh, to reduce the emissions. And uh, I'm starting to think about this question that we had. Uh, uh, Ericsson uh, is Northern Europe's largest buyer of air freight, and they changed their uh, logistical system and now sending more by ship and had reduced their emissions when it comes to air freight, for example, by making these kind of structural changes uh, in their supply. So I think there are many ways to be you. you uh, you can do this. That's very hopeful. Yeah. Maria? Yes, yeah, and Steph has already wished for, for better pricing. Yeah. I would go for more structure, structure land use, more dense land use, which is not only does it reduce the need for cost, but it also, when you do a trip, you, act, you can use, you, you do it shorter trips, so mm-hmm. it would be less emissions, and people seem to become uh, happier with shorter distances, so that's the key thing. Mm-hmm. That's final wish. If that, in that case, I think I would add also that I mean, life is not only living in cities, it's also being out in the countryside. So my wish mm. for the future perhaps would be that people spread out a bit. They still have to live in, in dense areas, but these mega cities that we see as a trend, my wish is no, I don't think that's the best uh, option for people to make, uh, live in mega cities. So let's have some kind of uh, kilo cities or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> kilo cities. That's it's wonderful. It's not only important yeah. in cities, the land use planning, it's Im- important even in smaller towns, it goes everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. You know what? That's a, that's a practical note to end with. Thank you so much. This is all we had time for on this topic this evening. Our panelists have been Mandar Dabhilkar, Maria Burjason, Mats Lexell, Steph Prost and Peter Kuhns. Thank you so much, all of you. We'll be back on the hour with aging in the future, which indeed is where age will affect us all. See you soon.